Everybody loves to do running back tier lists and wide receiver tier lists and all of that, but nobody ever wants to show love to the tight ends. And in this video, I'm going to give you guys a full tier list of the top 20 tight ends in fantasy football this year and all of the explanations behind these picks. I'm going to go into detail on what we look for for a breakout tight end, as well as tight ends that have a really good chance to exceed their ADP and just overall rankings. Y'all are going to enjoy. If you are new, please go ahead and hit that like button and subscribe if you haven't already, because you really should be doing that by now. But before I do begin to kick off this tier list, I want to give you guys some criteria on how I rank these tight ends and how you can make the decisions for yourself because on this page I'm all about teaching you guys how to win fantasy leagues and make these decisions and find information for yourself because at the end of the day you guys are the ones that are making these decisions and listening to people like me and whoever else is in the fantasy football space to help you make those choices so the first thing that I do look for when ranking my tight ends is obviously and this isn't anything special or crazy is last year's yards per game I know such a surprise but diving deeper into that stat I also look more heavily for yards per route run and how many routes these tight ends are actually running when they're on the field because if a tight end is on the field 90% of the time but he only runs routes on 50 he's blocking the rest of those snaps and he's really not as good of a fantasy value as a lot of people are expecting him to be we have to look for how often these tight ends are actually on the field and looking to catch passes and getting in that position and not just blocking or running fake routes the next quick step is we want to look for their identity in one tight end sets and two tight end sets for example tight ends usually run routes on about 67% of one tight end sets and when they're in two tight end sets they're usually running about an average of 60% of routes and the rest of the time they're either blocking or just doing something else and obviously anything over these numbers and over these percentages are going to give you a better chance to have a more pass catching tight end so that is the general threshold of what I'm looking for when I'm ranking these tight ends and this is really important because one of the most volatile positions if not the most volatile position in fantasy football is the tight end spot a lot of their value if you look at Jawan Johnson comes from touchdowns and if they're out there running a lot of routes it's just a given that they'll get more passes and probably more touchdowns. But I'm going to start off this tier list by putting Travis Kelsey up here at number one. I mean, he's been a top two tight end since 2016. This really should come as no surprise to any of you guys. He has been producing at a very high level for a very long time. He is getting up there in age. He's 33, but I mean, he has been an absolute elite value in fantasy, and I assume he's going to continue that. Last year, he led the NFL in red zone receptions with 30 and 10 red zone touchdowns. He was a whole 90 fantasy points above the number two tight end this year, so he's easily at the number one spot. But we have to move down a tier and give King Kelsey his own S tier. It's only right to pay homage to him. But at number two, first in the A tier, I have Mark Andrews, who finished outside the top 10 tight ends in fantasy points per game in nine out of his 16 active games. And that's a bit scary considering that a lot of the Ravens wide receivers were in and out of injury. But I do think he has a whole bunch of potential here. He only blocks on 1% of his one tight end sets, and he plays real snaps on 90% and goes for passes on 90% of his two tight end sets. And that is absolutely crazy. Monken is also slated to run a more pass heavy offense than Greg Roman did and this is all going to Mark Andrews production here he's going to elevate these receiving options in Baltimore and I don't really think Mark Andrews is that far behind Travis Kelsey there's a massive ADP difference in these two tight ends Travis Kelsey is being averaged at the sixth overall pick but Mark Andrews is being averaged at the 35th overall pick if you are looking for another tight end that's not a first round pick in Travis Kelsey Mark Andrews has so much value where he's being drafted right now my number three tight end on this tier list ranking is TJ Hawkinson and he has a some potential to sit with these big dogs at the table. He did block on 10% of his tight end sets, which is a bit higher than we would like to see, but he also had a bit of an up and down year last year. He just came off a season averaging almost nine targets a game in Minnesota, and it looks like he's stepping more into a pass catching role this year, and I really do like that. Number three is easy for me. But at number four on this list is where it gets a little bit interesting. You could go Kittle, Pitts, maybe even Waller, but I'm taking George Kittle here. He averaged 10 fantasy points a game in the first half of the season, but once Brock Purdy came in, he averaged 18 fantasy points a game, which is a huge difference. So in my opinion, it really does depend on who is going to take the majority of the starts for the quarterback position here. If it is Brock Purdy, he is a easy number four, maybe even top three potential as well. But if it is Trey Lance, He's going to take a little bit of a hit. He is still very, very efficient. So either way, I don't mind him here at number four, but that's kind of the quarterback confusion I'm getting here. There is also a decent amount of mouths to feed on this offense with Christian McCaffrey, Brandon IU, Debo Samuel, all of these really good receiving options. And if Trey Lance is the quarterback in this offense, it's going to be tough for him to get everyone the ball. And I'm putting Kyle Pitts at the tight end five right behind George Kittle here. I'm continuing this hype train from last season. But we all remember that last season was one to forget. He missed a good chunk of the season with injury and he didn't finish above the tight end 12 in fantasy points per game twice. And he did have a couple one digit fantasy football point games. He did have a pretty abysmal season last year, but only 56% of his targets were deemed catchable last year from Marcus Mariota. 
And I can't even put into words how terrible that number is. Like, I'm trying to say only half of his passes were even in his vicinity to make an effort to catch it. Like that is actually like that sucks. Now, hopefully Desmond Ritter can be even a little bit better than that. I mean, Marcus Mariota shouldn't really be too high of a bar to reach. They also did run a questionable offensive scheme for him. I mean, on a lot of the tight end one sets, they subbed him out and maybe that's because they just didn't trust him blocking yet. But either way, it is quite literally only up from here. And this offense is going to take a big step with guys like Bijan Robinson and Drake London really going to break out. I am going to throw Darren Waller into this tier. And in my opinion, he's kind of shadowing Travis Kelsey's position in his offense. I mean, I'm not comparing him to Travis Kelsey. Don't get me wrong for that. But they kind of have similar offensive opportunity. Like Travis Kelsey, he's essentially acting as a wide receiver one that you can put in your tight end position because like the Chiefs and the Giants, they really don't have an established wide receiver core yet. So he's going to be the go-to guy, just like Travis Kelsey. Waller could be a target vacuum just based on this offensive scheme and the fact that Sterling Shepard and Wandale Robinson are still dealing with injury. One setback that I did find though, is that he didn't have a single broken tackle last year. And for a tight end, that's pretty confusing. He also averaged the lowest PFF grade last season for tight ends. And statistically, he had one of his worst seasons in a very long time. He is going on his age 31 season and has been riddled with injuries here and there throughout his career. So so there are definitely some red flags, but there's also some green flags to look forward to here. If this offense were to lean more towards the passing game, he would be the immediate guy to be targeted. He is definitely more risky than all of these other tight ends in this ranking so far, but at the tight end six, I will take it. Moving down to tier, I'm taking Dallas Goddard on the Eagles. I mean, his offensive role really hasn't changed. He ran around on 91% of the snaps that he was on the field, which is a pretty good number but the Eagles don't really look his way that much. I mean, when you're looking at AJ Brown and Devonta Smith as much as they are, you really don't need to look at Dallas Goddard, which might be a good and bad thing. Every week I plan on having a big week, but uh, <laughs> you know, the worst part is this year, we led in so many games that we'd be in the second half of games. And if you didn't have your catches in the first half, we only ran the ball in the second half. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, it's tough, you know, it's not really always on me, my fantasy owners. Uh, it's, it's really on the team, you know, we just, we need to not be winning by so much because so we can throw and uh, catch up and uh, air raid offense, not run the ball. But that just speaks volumes to how good this team is. And there's definitely opportunity for him to improve. That being said, a lot of his targets do come in the short to intermediate game. And he doesn't really rack up that many yards after catch. And they didn't really lean on him for offense last year. And they made it to the Super Bowl. So I don't really expect them changing up that scheme very much. And I'm a bit more worried about his targets than I am his talent at a fifth round pick. But when you're on an offense that runs at this high caliber of a level, I'm, you have to put him up here. Next up, as the season does get closer, I'm finding myself liking Pat Fryermuth more and more, but there's a clear talent differential here. I am a little bit worried the Steelers don't run the most efficient offense, and they did just bring Allen Robinson, who is going to differentiate the targets with already good wide receivers in George Pickens and Deontay Johnson. He did have a bit of a down year numbers wise from his rookie year, but now he's going into his third season and the offense is more secure, at least than it has been in previous years. But he's also in a perfect position to have positive touchdown regression. He only scored two touchdowns last season. I'm sure that's going to go up. He did only run a route on 65% of his tight end one sets, which is just under average, but presumably he was blocking a lot because his offensive line just was not good. And he was a pretty consistent tight end performer last year. Now, granted, that wasn't a consistent high amount of fantasy points performer, but he was consistent and he got his targets. I do like his upside this year as well. But right next to him, I do have David Njoku on this tier ranking, who I've been bouncing back and forth between, but he just finished his very first season with the Browns as their full-time tight end one, and he did pretty good showing signs of breakouts. He was responsible for 28.6% of the Browns red zone targets last year, and that led all tight ends in the NFL. He's also big enough and athletic enough to stay on the field and block during these one and two tight end sets. And in these two tight end sets he was on the field running routes for 93 percent of these dropbacks i think this entire offense in the receiving game is going to take a huge step forward with deshaun watson actually getting time to play with this team but I mean, Deshaun Watson was improving every game last year. And that's a narrative people don't want to talk about. Besides his very first game back where he had to knock off most of the rust in weeks 14 through 18th, he averaged over 17 fantasy points a game, which might not seem like an amazing amount. It's definitely not a Josh Allen or a Jalen Hurts level. But when you're coming back to playing football after two years, that's pretty decent. On top of that, any improvements that Deshaun Watson makes during this offseason for this Browns team is going directly into David Njoku's opportunities. And I'm liking him in the eighth or ninth round of drafts a lot. I feel like I kind of just talked myself into moving him up, but I'm keeping him where he is. Evan Ingram is next on this list, who is another tight end that had a bit of a hot and cold season last year. He did have a top 10 tight end finish in six of his games last year, but the rest of those 11 games were not that good. His top three tight end finishes outside of those games was tight end 15, 17, and 26. And outside of those three games, they were all in like the 30s, 40s, and 50s. The Jaguars really started to utilize him in this offense in the second half of the season. 
But now they have Calvin Ridley, who's going to take a majority of his work specifically. And now the Jags have two good wide receivers that are going to command target share. The reason he was getting so much work is because they started drawing up plays for him. But now these other wide receivers are going to get the plays. And I doubt that they draw up too many specific for him with all of this talent they have now. Similar to George Kittle, I think there are a lot of mouths to feed on this offense. And we kind of need a perfect situation for him to break out. Next up on this list, I have Dalton Schultz on his new team in the Houston Texans. And he is one of the only established wide receivers for CJ Stroud. Stroud, if you, I guess, count him as a wide receiver, he's a tight end, but he still catches passes. But I really do think that he could act as the safety blanket for CJ Stroud in these first couple weeks, if not the entire season. He just came off two top seven tight end seasons, and if you're getting that in the 10th or 11th round, I really do like that value. Granted, this Texans offense is miles worse than the Cowboys, and the Cowboys did run a decent amount of plays specifically for him, which the Texans probably won't do, but the talent and opportunity is definitely there at his ADP. And to put this into perspective, the four wide receivers being drafted right around him is Jonathan Mingo's Zay Flowers, Darnell Mooney, and Sky Moore, which is clearly levels below him. But again, this offense most likely won't make noise, but he has the opportunity to be the one to make the noise. But next up in this tier, I do have Greg Dulcich, and I know the Broncos offense was not one to desire, but he does have the tangibles. One out of every three targets that were thrown his way from Russell Wilson was deemed uncatchable, and I do think that, I mean, Russell Wilson only has room to improve this year. He did not acclimate as well as we thought he was going to in this Broncos offense with Nathaniel Hackett calling the plays. But now Nathaniel Hackett's gone and they have Sean Payton. Another stat that people don't really want to talk about or maybe just don't think about is in the two games that Russell Wilson did start without Nathaniel Hackett on the field calling plays, he averaged over 24 fantasy points in those two games. Despite all of this, Dulcich averaged six targets a game the entire season. And the second half of the season, he averaged over eight targets a game. And next up on this tight end tier list, I do have Chiga Conquo, who definitely has some red flags. I mean, let's be real. Their quarterback situation is not a very good one. Ryan Tannehill is going to be the best bet for all of these pass catchers but I really do doubt that he starts and plays the entirety of the season but he did make some very very good plays and is an extremely athletic tight end with great run after the catchability we saw last year in games that Ryan Tannehill did start he averaged over 15 fantasy points a game and that completely dropped off when any other quarterback was playing if this offense can just stay efficient regardless of the quarterback that's throwing the passes he really does have a chance to exceed his ADP, but any tight end at this level we, we know are going to have some red flags. Next up on this tier ranking, I have Tyler Higby, who I'm a bit higher on than most people are this year, but the Rams are not going to be as bad offensively as most people are perceiving them to be from last year. I mean, Matthew Stafford is going to come back healthy, hopefully. Cooper Cup is going to be healthy. Their O-line is going to be healthy. I mean, they had so many holes in that O-line. But the Rams wide receiver core outside of Cooper Cup is the worst that they've had in the Sean McVay era, which is honestly a good thing for Tyler Higby because they're going to have to pass a lot to keep up with these other teams on offense. A bit of a disclaimer, he did get absolutely no passes downfield. Quite literally, all of his work was in the short to intermediate game less than 10 yards out, which is not good because his yards after the catch also isn't the best. And I think most of the value we're holding on with him is from his 2019 season but I mean this is just the reality of drafting tight ends you hold on to really anything you can get this low next up in this list I am taking Cole Komet who I'm not as high on this year as most people are especially with the addition of DJ Moore I mean if we're being honest Cole Komet was barely scraping by the catches and targets even without DJ Moore in this offense last year he solely relied on touchdowns for every single one of his startable weeks last year he had two games over 20 fantasy points he had four touchdowns over his expected total which is only behind George Kittle in the rankings which is not going to happen again and they also went out and got Robert Tunney who was a pretty decent pass catcher in Green Bay as well. Maybe he'll just come in for blocking, but best case scenario, he's not going to be that good outside of his ADP. But next up, I am going for Gerald Everett, who has one of the easiest tight end schedules in fantasy football this year. But the only reason I'm a little bit hesitant on him is because he kind of struggled to make production even with Keenan Allen and Mike Williams missing both significant amounts of time. With all of these wide receivers coming back healthy and Quentin Johnson being added to the roster, I really do find it hard for him to exceed ADP this year. With that being said, they did bring in Kellen Moore who made Dalton Schultz look like a top five tight end, which in talent, he's really not. So there are some things to look forward to and tight ends at this level, it's really going to be hit or miss. But at number 17, give me Jawan Johnson who had seven touchdowns last year, which is fourth in total tight end touchdowns. And that's really where all of his value last year came from. He just brought in Foster Moreau as well on a one-year deal who did pretty decent filling in for Darren Waller on the Raiders. They do still have Taysom Hill, who I think will probably take a step back now that they have an established quarterback in Derek Carr. But all this being said, he has a lot of competition at the tight end position. He does also have the second easiest tight end schedule. So, I mean, in the 11th round, if he can cement himself as the only tight end in this offense, I really do think he can exceed ADP by a lot. But that's easier said than done. And for these last three tight ends on the list, I'm shooting for straight upside because what's the point of taking a quote-unquote safe tight end in the last rounds? Because 
really that doesn't exist so you might as well just ball out and i'm taking jelani woods here and if you're not new to this page you know i've been talking about him a lot let me explain why for you new people he has a real shot to be anthony richardson's safety blanket in this offense the only wide receiver that he really has any competition with on the entire team is michael pittman and if he were to be anthony richardson's favorite target and even a safety blanket he's going to exceed adp an extreme amount i mean just look at how low he's going but at number 19 i'm giving you guys a two for one i'm taking dalton kincaid and dawson knox here i really do think it's unlikely for dalton kincaid to come in and take the number one tight end spot from dawson knox in this offense i mean it's really unlikely for a rookie tight end to do that the tight end position is one of the hardest to get acclimated to you don't only have to catch passes but you also have to block so rookie tight ends usually don't get full workloads the bills also have a really late week 13 bye which is going to be important for dalton kincaid because is a historical fact that teams involve their rookies more in the offense after their bye week and if that is going to happen in week 13 i i really don't think it's going to be valuable enough i mean even if he does surpass Dawson Knox, I don't really see it being any more than a 50-50 or even 60-40 split if you're being realistic. If I were you and Dawson Knox fell to me, I would personally draft him, wait a couple weeks for him to get his fantasy value up and then trade him off if you really are worried about Kincaid. Personally, I'm staying away from both of them, but in this Josh Allen-led offense, it is a valuable position for whoever wins it. But at number 20, you have to take a shot in the dark with our last tight end on this ranking, and the number one guy, Mr. Shot in the Dark, is Sam Laporta right now. He is a rookie for the Detroit Lions at the tight end position, and let me tell you, he is making some noise in training camp. He has a real shot to be the tight end one on this team. All he has to beat out is Brock Wright, who isn't that talented of a tight end. I mean, he could be doing that by week one. If you guys haven't seen the video of the top five breakout candidates from training camp, you need to go check that out. Sam Laporta is on that video and I have a more in-depth analysis of him and why I do really think he's a good tight end value. I'll have it pinned up here somewhere in the video so you will see it. But he is coming into a pretty good offense in the lines and with Jameson Williams taking a six game suspension, if he can cement himself in this first six games without him, he's really just a good value. But that is going to finish my top 20 tight end rankings. I mean, technically it's 21 because I gave you guys a little bonus, but I mean, I don't see anybody making these tight end rankings this in-depth, so if you did get anything from this video, please go ahead and hit that like button, and if you've made it all the way through, I assume you're following, because if you're not, you're just missing out on fantasy football value, but I do appreciate you guys hanging around this late in the video, and I will see you guys in the next fantasy football tips video coming later.